second. And then it says this, look in your notes. In Romans 6, 23, it says, what you've earned for your sin is death. Downer on Easter, Mark. Come on, man, let's get back to singing the songs. No, but this, this is the truth. The sins of your life and my life have earned us the right to be separated eternally from the true, the one and only true God who created us to be with him. He's perfect. He cannot tolerate and will not stand imperfection. And so all of our sins, which are our imperfection, they alienate us from the one true God. We have accrued a debt that we, in and of ourselves, cannot pay. Now, some people, you know, the next question in there is, well, why doesn't God just let us off? Why doesn't he just let us go? What's this whole deal with us having to pay the debt? I thought he was a loving God. That's why I don't believe in the Christian God. He doesn't love me. He wants to kill me. (laughs) Well, no, he does love you. But there's this, especially in our world today, there's this huge movement in evangelicalism that says, hey, just emphasize the grace, emphasize the love. Get big crowds in and I'll just talk about all the good things about the God stuff and that'll make them all feel warm and soft and safe. Oh, God is so good. And he is. But listen, God has to be just in the same way that he is loving and merciful and good. He has to be just. He's perfect in every way, in every phase of his character. And if he's not, he's no longer God. Now listen, go back to high school. Those of you who are old enough to not be there anymore, go back to high school, and if you're already there, remember these people. Does anybody remember the uh, substitute teacher that you could not wait to have substitute in your class? That substitute teacher that was such a pushover that you didn't have to do anything he said or anything that was planned for class that day? Does anybody remember that substitute teacher? In my high school, it was Mr. Schoberg. God bless him. That's what you say when you're about to talk badly about somebody. My high school teacher, Mr. Schoberg, uh, he, uh, he made the mistake when he first started his substitute career of not caught or not catching someone and doing something and, and, and giving them the riot act or sending them down to the principal's office. He just let it go. Guess what happens in a high school culture when you let something go? You know what happens. Everybody's like, hey, it's a free-for-all. Uh, <laughs> Would anybody agree that that substitute teacher in your memory had no authority in their classroom? Yeah, that they had absolutely no say in what was going on in their world because they, they didn't choose to have a say in what was going on in their world. They just abdicated their authority. Now listen, where there's too much love and mercy and no justice, there's anarchy. When there's too much justice and no love and mercy, there's tyranny. But in our God, there's a perfect balance of both. His love and his mercy, his love for you can never be bigger or smaller, just so you know. It's maxed out to the full and it stays that way. But his justice, it cannot and will not be compromised because his character won't stand it. So, here's the, all that to say this. Here's the deal. Your debts have to be paid. Your sins have to be atoned for. And that's where the cross comes in. Because a righteous and holy God requiring a sacrifice, requiring a death for the sins of all mankind chose his son to take upon himself the sins of the world and in so doing to die in our place, as our substitute, and free us from our debts. It's why we sing the songs. It's why we hang out here on Sundays. It's because of the cross. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that this is how God demonstrated his love for us. He demonstrated his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, his son died for us. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that Jesus became sin. I mean, he he didn't just, you know, have your your baddest sins or your 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 unspeakable sins, the stuff you've been hiding. He took all of mankind's sins. He became sin. And on the, the Roman cross, he died 
as a sacrifice for all sins. You know, people in the Jewish uh, faith would understand this pretty clearly. Uh, They had grown up going to temple once a year on a day called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I'll be right back. And on Yom Kippur, the priest would come to the temple and he would uh, sacrifice a, a bull and purify the temple, purify himself so that he was right in, uh, in being prepared for what would come. And on that day, the Day of Atonement, two goats would be uh, brought to the temple. And two goats would be chosen. And then the priest would cast lots. And uh, one goat would be chosen uh, to pay a death sacrifice, just like I've been talking to you about. Because even way back in Leviticus chapter 16, God had set it up that all sins must be atoned for by death. Now the way he took care of the children of Israel in those days is he sacrificed an animal, a goat. And the, <laughs> hey buddy. And the goat was given uh, as, as a substitute. The priest would come, he would lay both hands on the head of the goat and he would pray a prayer over the, the sins of the nation of Israel. And all the sins for the previous year would be put on this goat. And then the priest would sacrifice the goat. And the goat's blood would be shed. His life would be given. His innocence taken for the guilty. Another goat would be produced. And this goat, uh, the Bible tells us, would become the scapegoat. And the scapegoat was this this goat that, again, the priest would put both his hands on. And he would pray the, the sins of Israel over the goat. And then they did an interesting thing with this goat. They would take that goat. And instead of sacrificing it, they would lead it up the stairs of the temple. Come on, buddy. And they would head out outside the temple gates and down to the gates of the city, and everybody would follow them. And they would hand the goat off to a man whose charge was to take that goat as far away from the city as he possibly could so that that goat could never find his way back. Now some of you are like, oh. But don't miss the symbolism. You see, In the goats, we have Jesus. Because in Jesus, we have the one who was sacrificed, whose life was given so that we can indeed have life, so that our debt can be paid. He's our forgiveness. But not only that, and understand this, this is the great thing about the, the cross of Jesus Christ. He's also our scapegoat. He has taken the effects of sin in our lives, and he has driven them out of town. He's given us hope. He's given us the power of God on the other side of the cross for us to be able to handle up on the things that would drag us down in this life. So many people, they look at the cross and they think fire insurance. They just think, as long as I have this, I get out of hell free. But that's not all the cross is. The cross is about your lives now, experiencing the power of God and being free from sin. Yeah, that's that's where the cross comes in. Has the cross come into your life? Jesus hung there dying, excruciating death. He got to the end, and you can just almost picture it when you read the account that the sins of mankind were heaped on him. And he he yelled out to God, the Father in heaven. He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's at that moment that God the Father turned his back on God the Son. God the Son. 